session, and uh, we are we have two presentations this evening. The first is uh, Melissa Pettinger uh, from uh, uh, South Kitsap School District, and she's going to speak to us about Ready for Kindergarten. I am, and we've got a little presentation I want to show to you so you have a chance to. All right, so Ready for Kindergarten has been in South Kitsap for this is our eleventh year and um, I know we have Ready Dad here, we've got Jay here, so you guys know it but I think it's important for you as our community leaders to really understand what Ready for Kindergarten is because it really is a jewel in Port Orchard. So um, Ready for Kindergarten, next one please, is designed, um, all of it's based on brain research, they started it, do I have to stay here? Or grab the microphone and take it with you. It's oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll stay. All right. So um, in uh, in Kennewick, they started it. They had a they had a bold goal. I think it was 20 years ago, maybe 25. They wanted 90 percent of their third graders to be reading at level because we know if kids are reading at level in third grade, they're in a great space for the rest of their education. And so that's what they were shooting for. And so they had everybody teaching literacy. They had their kindergarten teachers, their PE teachers, their music teachers. Everyone was teaching literacy. But it didn't take them very long to realize you can't start on the first day of kindergarten and have kids where they should be as third graders. You really need to back that up. And this is why I love Ready. I came into Ready as a mom of four children. And, uh, and the first time I was there, they looked at me and they said, Melissa, we are going to invest in you because you are your child's first and best teacher. Not give me your kid, I know what's best for them, but you are. And so we're going to give you the ideas, the tools, the information that you need so that you can have your kids walk into that first day of kindergarten ready. And that's the background of ready for kindergarten. And so this is um, the, the handout that I gave to you has one that looks like this. This is an older, um, an older graph. It's 1.3 million students. This is bigger, 2.3 million kids. And what you're looking at is a graph at the bottom at second, third, fourth, up through 10th grade. And what they've done on this document is they've backed it up. And so you can see um, that that gap of reading scores, you see the highest quartile and the lowest quartile, comes in on that first day of kindergarten and can be traced back even before a child is born, which is incredible. So when you look at this, there's good news. Our schools are doing what they're designed to do. Every child makes one year's worth of growth every year. But that catch up is really hard to do. And in a study this size, you don't see the individual kids who make those jumps. And they make them because they have a ton of support at school and more support at home. And so what you see there is that, is that um, the child at the top as a second grader, her friends in the lowest quartile don't read at the same level until seventh grade. And that's a disaster and a heartbreaking situation. So what do we do about it? In South Kitsap, what we do it about it is we invest in those families and in those parents. If you have any questions, please ask them because I could talk about this all day, but I'm going to try not to. All right, so the next slide, please, um, talks really about the amazing things that happen in the first five years of life. Um, you probably have heard that children learn languages faster than adults. The reality is children learn everything faster than adults. I used to tell parents that their children made 700 neural connections a second, and that was mind-boggling to me, but that's old research. Today's research, Harvard says, children in these first five years are making one million neural connections a second. A second. Mr. Mayor, do you know what's happening in your brain right now? <laughs> I'm paying attention. You're, yeah, you're, you're pruning. And that's a good thing. That's what your adult brain is designed to do, right? To be able to, to have the, the connections that you need and you use the most often that are there. But in order for you to have stuff to prune, you had to have somebody who built and fluffed all those neurons for you when you were little. And that's what Ready for Kindergarten really optimizes on, is that children have two options. They're sleeping or they're learning. And when they're sleeping, they're processing all the good things that they're learning. And so Ready costs money, obviously, but it's about the cheapest way that you can invest in making a forever difference for a child and for their trajectory. 
Questions about this one? All right, let's keep moving. All right, READY is also based on brain research for adults. We meet for 90-minute sessions because after 90 minutes, our adult brains are done. You probably know that from some of your meetings, right? And so, so it's designed to be hands-on, fast-paced. We call ourselves facilitators, not teachers, because we're in a room of experts. We have five different age groups, so many would be in the youngest age group, and kids who start kindergarten this fall would be the oldest age group. Um, and they're fast-paced. Parents go home with beautiful toys. We call them tools. And when they come to the first orientation, I always tell them, you think, you know, you came here and this is a free thing, there's got to be a hook. And there is. Here's the hook. The free things that you're taking home with you, those toys, don't put them where your kids can have them and play with them whenever they want. Because what is the most valuable thing to your kids? It's you. And so those things come out when you have time to put your phone away, you know, to turn off the television, and to spend time interacting and playing with their kids. And so um, those things, we know, again, from, from research, are going to be the most effective for parents to go home and to work with their children. Next slide. So um, I have a friend who had a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a one-year-old. Surprise, twins. <laughs> I don't know any, any parent, whether you have one child or you have five who are four and under, that has extra time. And Ready for Kindergarten is not designed to take up time you don't have. It's designed to fit into your life. So when you're at the grocery store, you can be in the produce department. You can be saying, hey, I'm thinking of something that's yellow and the shape of a curve. You're right, it's a banana. It's about using the time that you have. Or you're at the checkout and you could read that John Travolta really is an alien. Or you could say to your little darling, help me, can you find something in our cart that starts with a p, p, p? Good, potatoes. That's playing with a purpose. It could mean playing with the puzzle that you go home with or the game that you go home with. But it could be when you're driving in the car and you're saying nursery rhymes together. Or when you're outside and you're scooping snow and scooping snow and scooping snow and you're counting scoops. And then, of course, reading with your kids for 20 minutes every single day. So these are broad, universal things that everybody can get on board with. But again, it's based on what fits with those parents, what resonates with them. We're going to give them great ideas and great information. And the good news is that it's not my ideas. It's all based on that research. And so parents can go home equipped to do the good things that they want to do with their children. And we meet three times a year, which is good news for people like me because I am lazy. And when I needed that reminder as a mom to be doing those things, to be reading with my kids, to be talking with my kids, to be counting with my kids, it was time for another session of Ready for Kindergarten because we meet three times a year from birth until they walk into that first day of kindergarten. So it really is a fantastic program. And this last slide, talks about some of the research. And uh, James Heckman, evidently he's a big deal um, if you're a, a money cruncher, um, says that when we invest in early childhood education, the return is incredible. Not just financially, educationally, but also with health, with social and emotional outcomes, lots of good things. Um, Washington State University looked at the, in the Tri-Cities where it first started in Kennewick. And this is thrilling news. Um, 55% of their families who come to kindergarten had the skill set that they needed. And you think back to that graph, that's, that's hard. That's hard. In 2008, 79% of their kids whose parents attended met, you know, came in with or above the, what they needed to have a successful year. So... Jay has always pushed us, we need local data, we need local data, we need lo local data, and we finally have it, um, at least a piece of it. And so that's when I called and I said, can I come and talk to you guys again? I was here a few years ago, so thanks for letting me come back. Actually, I texted Fred, I'm like, who do I talk to? And um, by the way, kudos to Fred with, with what he does for that Port Orchard page because it has helped our community to become more of a community, so thank you for that. Um, so here's the good news. In South Kitsap, they do an assessment in the fall called the STAR-EL. 
um, star early literacy. And what we know is that 2017, 59.9% of kindergartners in Washington started with the skills that they needed. So this is just a slice of the research. It's not the full big picture. But we did a survey. We asked parents to tell us if they attended Ready for Kindergarten. We don't know if they attended once or if they attended 15 or 6. But when we looked at the literacy component, 90.3% of South Kitsap kids whose parents have come to Ready for Kindergarten classes were where they needed to be. And that is like, if I could do a backflip, I would have done it when, when we got to see that research, because we knew it was the right work. But to see that is really, really thrilling. So I'm here for three reasons. I would love for you to come and see it. And I don't know if you really appreciate what that would mean to our community, <laughs> to have our community leaders come and sit down next to young parents and, 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 and realize that this is a big deal. Some of our parents don't have good memories from their own schooling. And so when they come in, it's a hard thing. And maybe they come in with a little bit of, a, of, a, of an exterior, like, I don't know if I'm ready for this, you know, kind of the arms crossed. And so a lot of our service organizations, the Seroptimus, the Kiwanis, Rotarians, um, they do a lot of good things for us. And one of the things that they do is they serve as greeters. And so I would love you to ponder doing that work, which means, Jay's done it before, you stand outside, you say, hey, welcome to Ready, and you hand them a pencil. And you may think it's not a big deal, but you're that first people who get to kind of tap at that outer layer so that we can start talking about what really matters to them, and that's their kids. So that would be one of, one of the pieces if you could come. And I gave you a flyer like this, and on the back side are our spring dates. We meet again April 27th, April 30th, May 2nd, and May 4th. All identical classes. Some days we have Spanish. All four days we have English. Um, sessions and the times that are listed there ideally you'd want to come a half an hour early so you can hear the orientation which is the 30 minute um, version of what I did with you here but it gets parents a chance to see the big picture before we do that um, so that's the first first ask um, the second ask is if you look at this hello service organization members letter we have big financial struggles this year that I've never seen with Ready in the 12 years that we've had. Title dollars were cut at the federal level. Title dollars were used to help cover other expenses in the district. And so typically our budget's about $50,000. We have $17,000 this year. And we spent it all in the fall. And you know, there's not a lot of bells and whistles with what we're doing. Um, it's about as lean as it can be. The winter session was covered, I call it Karst's Magic Pocket. Our superintendent somehow has a fund and he was able to cover that for us. And we're going through with the spring session. I don't know how they're paying for next year. That's not my job to figure out that piece of it. But if you hear of a grant, if there is something that, that that our city can do, this is worth investing in. I just read an article today. Um, that said, you know, and we all know it's true, education is a key to a lot of things that are important for our city. Our economy would be better if our people were better educated. Um, but I just read today that 85% of children who are in the juvenile court system are functionally illiterate. So this investment that we're making in these families in this fun and joyful way is not just setting that trajectory for school. It's going to make our community safer. It's going to cost less for our own police force, um, for our own incarceration thing. So, so there's lots of layers of good that happens with this. And third ask, what we hear all the time from parents is, I wish we had known about this sooner. 
And again, you guys are a big deal in our community. People look up to you and, and you serve us well. And you would serve us well also by helping us let no young families know that this is available for them in our community. Anyone in South Kitsap School District, there is no cost. And this is a beautiful thing because it's not based on what you make or what you don't make. It's based on the fact that you have children that this community cares about. So if you would help with that, that's the third big thing. So come, help us find out how to pay more to pay for this good thing and um, help people to know more about it. Questions? I, fabulous program, great presentation, and I, would, I happen to know some people associated with the Kurt Wagner Education Fund. Awesome. You should reach out to them. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, they do so many good things for our community, for sure. Good. All right. I just want to say it's a fantastic program. I know that from experience. And I love the passion which you bring to this subject. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's, it's not hard to have passion for something that makes this kind of a difference. So, All right. Thank you guys very much for what you do. Thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. Hopefully I'll see you in April and May. <laughs> All right. We have a uh, second presentation tonight. Uh, Steve Siegel is in the audience, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the community center project that uh, he's working hard on. And I think he's got a couple of videos he's going to play, too. So, Mr. Siegel. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. Appreciate you taking the time to, again, let me... Uh, share an update on the progress of the project that includes a, a master plan, but uh, a most recent and most important focus is the community event center project that we're, uh, we're working so hard to fund through a number of sources. And the primary uh, objective is to achieve funding of uh, the uh, Kitsap Public Facilities District uh, current application process. So um, to that end, uh, I just want to give you an update on what's going on, where we are in the process, what's happening imminently, and what you should know about how that will then uh, evolve in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, so last night I attended the first two presentations to the Public Facilities District. It was the, the, uh, the North Kitsap, uh, Port Gamble, Heritage Park Project, Kit Kitsap County sponsored, and the Central Kitsap School District Library Project at the new Central Kitsap High School campus, middle school campus. Uh, just to kind of learn more about that process. And there's six applicants. So those were the first two. Two weeks from last night, March 11th, we'll be presenting uh, as well as part of our project. And, and to that end, you know, we, we, we understand the criteria for this process. And we're confident, not, not in excess, but solidly confident that the criteria that have been uh, created to fund projects for the public facilities district, both by state legislative mandate and the county's establishment of our own public facilities district that we fit beyond perfect the, the criteria. And so we know we're in a really good position and are likely to be funded. Our objective is to achieve maximum funding for what could be a 15 to $20 million project. You've seen the previous iterations of what we, we shared last time I was here in terms of some ideas where, uh, as far as the, the elevations and footprint and all that. I will share that we're we're going to have another set of um, of drawings soon to to share, and that'll be part of our presentation on March 11th. But I wanted to point out three things that we're doing right now that that are of interest and of value, that are a little different than anybody else is doing in this process. <clears throat> the first is a fairly extensive uh, community outreach program. We have a, a very uh, healthy uh, social media campaign, a Facebook page, a, 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 a website. Um, in fact, I'm going to address uh, Sarah Johnson back here with, with little Benny, who um, is in that pre-kindergarten uh, group, uh, has been working for the last couple of months now on this, and very successfully so. We've, we've gleaned hundreds of, of uh, petition signers. There's, I'm going to hand this out so you can see what we're doing, but it's a, but you might have seen this in some of the restaurants and businesses downtown. It's a petition that describes our outreach to the public facilities district about why they should support the project. Nothing else is happening like this in the county for any of the, any of the other applicants. We've got hundreds of signers, both electronically and, and, and you know, physically through signatures here, uh, as well as a lot of input and comments and letters from stakeholders who want to be a part 
a part of this project. So can I approach Scott, you and share this and Absolutely. if you just pass it around? Yeah, thank you. And you're, you're free to sign if you so move. Um, and <clears throat> and that, that uh, is, is part of a, an outreach. We, we have a, a theme, a campaign called Imagine Port Orchard. We got t-shirts, stickers, um, Kitsap Bank employees are going to be wearing them soon on Fridays instead of Seahawks. Since there's no Seahawks Fridays anymore, it'll be Imagine Port Orchard Fridays. Uh, but the theme is to try to encourage people to provide some feedback about what they'd like to see, to, uh, to develop some sense of some, some um, ideas and concepts that maybe we haven't considered. We created a stakeholder group. And I'm trying to remember among you who might have been there, uh, but we had representatives from the city. I think, uh, Nick, you were there, weren't you? Yeah, Nick was there on behalf of the city. Rob was out of town, but we had um, the county. Charlotte Garrido was there, Com Commissioner Garrido. But a whole bunch of businesses and interests in downtown, the port, uh, the school district. And we're working hard to consolidate all these ideas to make certain that we don't leave anything off the table. I don't want to look back in five years and, and, and realize that we've overlook something so obvious about what we could include in this wonderful community event center. Um, so that's part of the, the, the community outreach program. The other applicants are asking for funding from the public facilities district to do what we're already doing. So I guess after listening to that last night, I kind of feel more confident that we're on the right path. Uh, the second thing we're, we're doing is we're, um, we've, we've uh, created a a, a process to develop an environmental impact study. A company called Econ Northwest, and based in Seattle and Portland, regional firm uh, that does this kind of work all around and including in this area, is providing the background data for what the economic impact really is going to quantify, what it's going to look like when we're, we're truly fully uh, developed as a community event center and the resultant master plan project around that. And that includes everything from the kinds of values and impacts from tourism and, and visits and activity around downtown, but also the jobs that are part of the, the, de the design and the construction of the projects, as well as all the jobs that will be located downtown, uh, as well as the retail and the residents who will be living downtown. And so it's important not just to be confident that we can agree that that's the case, that there's going to be a, a large economic impact, it's of great value to quantify that and have some hard data, um, uh, some local information. I heard reference to uh, uh, Councilmember Jay Rosapepe earlier needing local, local data. Well, we're working on that right now for this project, uh, Jay, and I think we're going to have something to share. I was hoping to have a draft today, but it's not quite done. That's part of our presentation as well. And we expect to have a full room of people at our presentation on March 11th, and we invite you all to come um, to witness something very special for, for Port Orchard. Um, and we've talked about this before, and I won't go over the, the issues, but it really is Port Orchard's turn. It's our time. It's, it's uh, the, the, the Public Facilities District Board is cognizant of the fact that they have yet to fund a South Kitsap project. And one of the important themes that we've kind of reminded the constituents, the citizens here in, in South Kitsap is this isn't some new tax. This isn't some new funding mechanism to create something that's going to cost anybody anything more. Right now, every day, those taxes that go to that public facilities district that creates that bonding capacity of about $20 million was their proposed take on this next round of, of capacity on bond funding. That money's already happening, coming in the door, and there's no new taxes. And if we don't capture that, it's going to continue to go to Bremerton and Polsbo and Bainbridge Island and wherever else it goes. And we, we love our county, we love our, our, our brethren and you know, family around Kitsap County, but it's our turn to have something here in South Kitsap, and that's an important part of this theme. One thing, I've attended every public facilities district meeting since December, and the one theme I hear over and over again is it's South Kitsap's turn. They just have to have a proposal that we have confidence makes sense, and we need to hear from South Kitsap. We need to know they want this. It's just not a handful of people in, you know, in, a, in a boardroom somewhere saying we think this is an important thing. We need to hear from the community, and that's why all this is, is happening. And finally, I'll, I'll kind of wrap this up and answer any questions, and I'm going to show you a, a couple of a videos in a moment. We're working on, a, a, I think, a very effective video that's part of our presentation, part of our social media presence, part of our messaging and marketing to the community, 
And you'll see some references in here, and one of those is to um, the, the interest, and now it's even more public that we can share this, that, that Kitsap, Kitsap Bank is 110 years now in Kitsap County, founded in Port Orchard. And they are, are looking to consolidate their, their headquarters into a corporate headquarters somewhere. And they have multiple options. And Port Orchard's one of those options. And Port Orchard is the preferred option. But it was a big mountain to climb. I mean, looking back three or four years ago, in terms of a lot of issues related to zoning and, and the, 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 uh, the ability to consolidate properties and make this work, uh, it was a costly, they couldn't expand because of the, their location now on the waterfront and the DNR leases, et cetera. And they looked at other, in fact, one of the options was outside of the county. And they've never said anything about it. They've never threatened it. They've just kept their heads down. And we started working together a year and a half ago. They made it clear this is where they want to be. And now they're really excited about the fact that this is where they're probably going to be for the next 100 years. Not that they would leave us, but they would now be able to build a corporate headquarters around 200 plus employees working in downtown Port Orchard. Think about what that means. And as um, their CEO, Steve Politakis, would say, it's not jobs, it's careers they're building. A place for children and grandchildren who are born and raised in Kitsap County in South Kitsap to make a career here in their own town, the kind of career that the Amazons and the Expedias are recruiting uh, employees for now, the kind of technology jobs that don't exist really to much volume or degree here. So that's an exciting prospect. And to them, as you'll see in a moment, this community event center really is the keystone to making that happen. And I'll answer questions about that if you have any, but it's, it's all about the amenities for employees, about the re restoration of the shoreline and the waterfront, about Portrait downtown truly being something that is a part of the future of a place that can attract the kind of people and the kind of quality of employees and, and careers um, that they can build in, in this community. So I think we're on that path now, and it's really good news. Um, we just need to keep our heads down and get this next piece done. I'm working with uh, Representative Kilmer's office and the state and some private benefactors to fully fund this project. If we get this PFD funding, I'm very, very confident that's going to happen. So we'll come back and report more on that later. Uh, but Brandy, if you wouldn't mind, if you wouldn't start with Kathleen Wilson's, this is a rough cut of, of some video interviews, not the finished product. You'll see that in a couple of weeks as well. But um, if Brandy, if you'd show that for us, I'd sure appreciate it. Steve, while we're waiting, yeah. Yeah. Um, my <coughs> question is, you said there's a presentation on March 11th? March 11th at the you, Public Facilities District. Okay, and you didn't Silverdale. tell us the time. It's, so their meeting starts at 5.30. Okay. We're the first on the agenda, so rough, last night it was roughly 6 about the time the first presenter started. And by the way, another, made me think of something else, um, Beck, is that tonight the Port of Bremerton is doing something that I'm making, you know, they've agreed to be our public partner. I've said, I want that memorialized, I want that in a public vote, so that's happening tonight. Um, the Port of Bremerton is our public partner uh, on this project and will facilitate uh, the relationship that we develop with the PFD for, for the funding. And I I'm sorry to seem a little ignorant, yeah. but where is their Silverdale office? Beach Hotel. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I will send definitely. I'm, you're going to get. I'll get update emails as we this next week as we get into more of this, and I can provide kind of an outline of the presentation. I'll send you a, a separate email, but it's okay. next March 11th, two weeks from last night, Monday night, Silverdale Beach Hotel, 5:30, but six ish is when we're on, and there'll be Sarah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll have mm -hmm. probably a hundred people there or more with T-shirts and stickers all wearing Imagine Portrait stickers, T-shirts, speakers, school, every, it's, okay. it's gonna be something that they've never seen before. They may never wanna see again, I don't know, but we're gonna oh. put on a show. So Any Steve, yeah. how much is the current concept that you're putting forward different from what we've seen before? Not much, I mean, you know, the, the, 
the one thing we've been careful to do is not create a concept in concrete that says, here's the building elevations design, because we want to build around programming, uses, functions. So we're really focusing on, on users and tenants and partners and stakeholders at this point. Okay, here, here we go. Let's go back to the beginning. If you don't mind. The great thing about the and you'll see here, this is Kathleen Wilson. You all know Kathleen, the, the regional KRL branch manager. And she's speaking about the KRL as an important partner as well. They're going to be moving there. We're working with the, the WWCA and others as well to kind of be a part of, of the ongoing presence in the, in the community event center. Um, but we haven't, Scott, we haven't changed much as far as, you know, it's really about the programming side. Mm -hmm. I'm going to meet with our architects again Friday morning and kind of play around a little bit more. We really don't want to throw something out there until we get all the pieces and stir it up and make sure we've truly scratched all the itches that need to be addressed. So um, that'll come. I mean, we, when we get to the next phase, if the, if the PFD selects us to be their finalist or one of the finalists, we'll really start digging into them funding the design process and them funding all the next pieces. And it's really a public process. It's not mine or ours. or It's a public process that is um, funded by the public and partnered with a public entity, the, the port. Uh, so we'll continue to want to include and give input in the process because we know how that could complement the master plan, but we truly don't control that outcome. Randy, you. you ready? We really feel like it is time for Port Orchard to have a new library location. We love being on the downtown waterfront, but we are a really busy library. We service 15,000 people coming in our doors every month. The great thing about the Community Event Center location is that it will keep the library right downtown and right on the waterfront. So we'll continue to be a part of this vibrant downtown community. I'm Kathleen Wilson, branch manager of the Port Orchard location of Kitsap Regional Library. We imagine a new water front location for our Port Orchard Library, continuing to serve our community in the ways that we do, but adding to that, um, services will still, of course, include checking out books, but we can also maybe check out kayaks. special to Kitsap Bank because this is where we were founded over 110 years ago. This is our home. You know, our administrative headquarters right now are bifurcated in two different locations. Uh, we have a lot of employees based elsewhere, and we would love to bring everybody back to Port Orchard where we could work more efficiently together. We believe the South Kitsap Community Event Center is a great opportunity to serve as a linchpin for future growth in Port Orchard. We think it could really provide uh, a beachfront, a beachhead, uh, literally on the waterfront of Port Orchard and could really spur economic activity. My name is Tony George. I'm President and Chief Operating Officer of Kitsap Bank. I imagine Port Orchard being a vibrant waterfront-based community with all kinds of activities for people to come and enjoy, uh, active business and retail community, access to the water, access to the ferry system. I think it could be a really special place. Center downtown Port Orchard will give us a, a new library, a central gathering place that we've never had before, and a create a regional draw for businesses and other users. I'm Rob Putansu, mayor of the city of Port Orchard. Well, what I imagine are business and living opportunities that activate our downtown. We have the pedestrian path, we have our water and mountain vistas, we have restaurants. This project will result in a restoration of our shoreline, ultimately reclaiming public access to the beach and water. And I believe a community center will create jobs and business opportunity. Well, numerous projects have been funded by the Public Facilities District, and South Kitsap has yet to have a project. Simply, it's our time. So those three interviews, and there's another one coming from a you know, younger and millennial and family, and, and they're, they're part of a narrative that will be part of a video that we'll present, but it'll be part of our ongoing messaging that will, I think, 
build credibility in the next six months to a year as we continue to add more tools to, to what we're building here in, in, in Port Orchard. So are there any more questions or observations? Or Well, thank you for your time and look forward to coming back again with some good news, you know, a check or some promise of one, and we'll keep this going. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we are to uh, our business items this evening. And uh, the first is uh, item A, adoption of an ordinance approving the collective bargaining agreement with the Teamsters for Public Works. Deb Howard isn't here, but I'll bet Noah's going to step in. Thank you, Mary. Council members, uh, the city's negotiating team consisting of City Attorney Sharon Cates, Mayor Rob Patansu, Finance Director Noah Crocker, Public Works Director Mark Dorsey, Utilities Facilities Operations Manager Thomas Hunter, and HR Coordinator Deborah Howard has reached a tentative agreement with Teamsters Local Number 589, representing the City's Public Works employees. The agreement has been ratified by the Public Works Employees Bargaining Unit. The agreement is not a public document until approved by Council and signed by the parties and therefore is not attached to the staff report. The city's negotiating team recommends that the city council ratify the collective bargaining agreement and authorize the mayor to execute the agreement. Charity. Mayor, I move to adopt an ordinance ratifying the terms of the collective bargaining agreement with Teamsters Local 589 representing the Public Works Employees' Bargaining Unit and authorizing the mayor to execute the same. Second. Motion and a second by Councilmember Diener. Questions or comments? I know this is why we were back in the bargaining session was talking about the specifics of the uh, contract and I'm very thankful that we were able to reach agreement with our Teamsters the, uh, employees. Uh, there was, those are our Public Works employees who, uh, as we heard from the public earlier this evening, worked very hard through the snowstorm snow, snow and uh, continually do a good job for the city. So I'm happy to, to reach this agreement. So other questions? from Noah or comments? Okay. With that, be voting on the adoption of an ordinance approving the collective bargaining agreement with the Teamsters for Public Works. All in favor, say aye. 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 Do we have any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is carries. Contract is approved. And we are to the second item this evening, which is 7B, adoption of an ordinance approving certain benefits for non-union represented employees classified as FLSA non-exempt and executive exempt. Mr. Crocker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as the council knows, uh, for all our non-representative employees, uh, we have a history of offering them the same benefits that we have offered our public works and Teamsters. Uh, and so this ordinance here reflects uh, the same offer that we have negotiated with our Teamsters. As requested by the Finance Committee, employee wage rates are addressed on an annual basis for non-union employees. Starting January 1st, 2019, the rates of pay for non-union represented employees uh, were increased by two and a quarter percent. The Finance Committee has recommended an additional wage pay rate adjustment of 1.05 percent and additional changes in benefits for this group. The following changes are recommended as follows. Um, all employees covered by this ordinance shall be classified and compensated in accordance with the city's biennial budget. Effective March 17, 2019, the rates of pay for the non-union represented employees uh, shall increase by one and five hundredths percent. And effective April 1st payroll, all benefits listed in the attached Appendix A uh, will be adjusted for the non-union represented employees classified as FLSA non-exempt and executive exempt only. Uh, staff would recommend adopting this ordinance and authorizing the rate of pay increase of 1.05% as well as adopting uh, the Appendix A beginning April 2019. Council Member Ficciardi. Here I move to adopt an ordinance establishing certain employee benefits for non-union represented employees classified as FLSA non-exempt and, exempt and executive exempt. Motion by Council Member Charty, second by Council Member Diener. Any other additional questions for Mr. Crocker? Hearing none, you'll be voting on the adoption of an ordinance approving certain benefits for non union represented employees classified as FLSA. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. 
We are to 7C, adoption of an ordinance, thereby causing new chapter 12.36, new sections 13.04 and 13.06, adopting the 2019 Public Works Engineering Standards and Specification and repealing resolution number 006-14. Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Your Honor, <coughs> Council Members. On January 28th, 2019, the City's Public Works Department brought forth the draft 2019 Public Works Engineering Standard and Specifications, or Standards, to the Land Use Committee for initial review and discussion. The purpose of the proposed Ordinance 006-19 is to update the Port Orchard Municipal Code and to adopt new Public Works Engineering Standards and Specifications to provide continued compliance with the City of Port Orchard's Water System Plan, Comprehensive Sanitary Sewer Plan, Transportation Element element of the Comprehensive Plan, Stormwater Plan, and the Phase Two MPDS Permit via established engineering standards and specifications. Additionally, Resolution Number 006-14 must be repealed to allow the standards to be integrated within the Municipal Code via codification. At the February 19, 2019 work study session, which was last week, the matter was discussed by the council and referred to the next regular meeting for action as adoption of this ordinance must occur prior to the adoption of the 2019 zoning code update. Staff recommends adoption of ordinance 006-19 amending the Port Orchard Municipal Code by creating new chapter 12.34 and new sections 1304-300 and 1306-300 adopting the 2019 Public Works Engineering Standards and Specifications and repealing Resolution 006-14. And I would like to request, since the clerk's office did make, I believe, made a copy for every packet, if you don't necessarily want to put this on your bookshelf, uh, maybe when you're done looking at the final product given? No, we didn't provide it. We didn't get it. Oh, I have one. Oh, never mind. It was I was going to say. available electronically. So. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to say I have one here, but if anybody, I, I didn't know you guys didn't have copied. If you did, I would want them back so I could give them to the Public Works staff, but never mind. But if you would like a printed copy and you do not have one, let me know and I'd be happy to provide them to you. Okay. I have one right here. <laughs> Council Member Lucarelli. I move to adopt ordinance number 006-19, amending the Port Orchard Municipal Code by creating new chapter 12.34 and new sections 13.04.300 and 13.06.300, adopting the 2019 Public Works Engineering Standards and Specifications and repealing resolution number 006-14 with final form approved by the City Attorney. Second. Second by Council Member Chang. And I, I want to celebrate the fact that this work product was the result of our new uh, engineer that we hired, Ian. He is working out fabulously, and uh, I know Mark would, would echo that. And uh, he, he's the one that uh, brought this to the finish line for us. And uh, we've got many, many more tasks for him just like this. Mm -hmm. So he's being uh, well utilized. Other questions for Mr. Dorsey? Okay, we talked about this at length, I think, a week ago. So you'll be voting on the an ordinance amending the code, to creating a new engineering standards and specifications. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 <coughs> Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. We are on to 7D, which is adoption of a resolution adopting a reimbursement expenditures policy. Mr. Dorsey, or Mr. Crocker. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, last meeting we talked about this uh, briefly, a reimbursement resolution, and that's uh, what I'm bringing forward tonight. So the City of Port Orchard recently created an equipment rental and revolving fund. As part of the 2019-2020 budget, the City Council approved the acquisition of vehicles and equipment amounting to a total expense of $1,226,000 no, $1, for the biennium. <laughs> a billion. <laughs> a lot of trucks. A million there. Uh, in order to best manage the city's cash resources, some or all these vehicle acquisitions may be financed at a future date. The city council desires to have the flexibility to reimburse itself from those proceeds of the borrowed funds if they choose to seek financing. 
A reimbursement resolution is a document which can provide the city that flexibility to achieve its goals. The concept of a reimbursement resolution was brought forward to the Finance Committee on February 19, 2019. The Finance Committee discussed the benefits of the reimbursement resolution <coughs> and recommended it be brought forward to the full council for approval to provide the flexibility and to allow the city to reimburse itself from any future borrowings. Staff would recommend that the city council approve the reimbursement resolution as presented. Councilmember Ashby. Yes, I move to adopt a resolution approving the reimbursement to the city of equipment expenditures paid by the city prior to the financing of such expenditures. Second, Second by Councilmember Cacciardi. I'm going to give you an Alan Martinism here. This is a bit of a belt and suspenders. Uh, as he would say, and uh, we may not need this resolution, but if we don't have it in place and we chose later for cash flow reasons mm -hmm. to go out and fi finance uh, these vehicles, we could not claw back those vehicles that we'd already purchased prior to doing that borrowing. So it's just really just in case. Yeah, and to be clear, um, any future borrowings, we would bring forward a financing contract. So this does not achieve a financing contract. It is a reimbursement resolution that allows us to reimburse ourselves. So any future borrowings that you'd still have to take action on. Questions for Mr. Crocker? Okay. With that, you'll be vote, voting on the adoption of a resolution adopting a reimbursement, a, a reimbursement, a, oh. a resolution for reimbursement of, of expenditures. I don't know why that was so tough. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Motion carries. <clears throat> we are to 7E, approval of change order number 13 to contract number 037-17 with active construction for the Tremont widening project. Mr. Dorsey. Uh, thank you, Your Honor, Council Members. On November 27, 2018, the City of Port Orchard City Council authorized change order number 2A and change orders 8 through 11 for contracts 037-17 with active construction, thereby bringing the current value of all change orders to date to a total of $1.24 million, or 123.8% of the contingency value. Change order number 12 was an administrative no-cost change order approved by the Public Works Director on December 19, 2018, concerning uh, DBE realignment. Uh, Tonight's action is for the approval of change order 13 being a design-based change needed for the east-west attention vault, the access lids at an estimated value of $24,500. Approval, approval of this change order brings the current value of all change orders to date to a total of $1.261 million, $1.262 million, or 126.2% of the contingency value. Please note the city's CACM team continues to prepare an updated cost to complete value whereby the change orders and credits from the schedule of values are determined. And as a side note, the Public Works Director is actively seeking to find additional funds for this project. Um, staff recommends that the City Council authorize the Mayor to execute change order number 13 with active construction in an amount not to exceed $24,500. Councilmember Diener. Mr. Mayor, because I want this thing to finish, I move to authorize <laughs> the mayor to execute change order number 13 with active construction incorporated in an amount not to exceed $24,500. Second. Second by Councilmember Lucarelli. No matter, because we are in excess of, bu of budget now on this project, you know, every change order, no matter the amount, will be coming before the council. So you're going to see a, a string of them here for the next number of meetings and uh, as Mr. Dorsey alluded to we're you know uh, asking TIB if they've got any spare change and uh, PSRC and other sources um, you know we we put some additional funds in the budget but we're uh, we'd like some some more grant awards if we can get them so with that so we'll be talking about Tremont a lot in the next few months and then we'll be done and then we'll be done and then we will be done. Have a nice we can window. talk about something else. <laughs> we can talk about something else. I think we have enough on the docket. Yeah. Big sales. Big sales, yes. So, all right, so we'll be voting on uh, change order number 13, contract number 037-17, with active construction for the Tremont Widening Project. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved. The change order is. 
So we're to 7F, approval of the 19, 2019 Comprehensive Plan Amendment Docket. Uh, Mr. Bond. Thank you. Uh, Mayor and members of council, tonight before you is the 2019 Comprehensive Plan Amendment Agenda. Pursuant to Port Orchard Municipal Code Section 20.04, the Comprehensive Plan application, application deadline is January 31st in a given year. Uh, we did not receive any private applications this year, but we did file three applications on behalf of the city uh, as initiated by the mayor. I am to present these, uh, I'm to docket these proposed amendments and create an agenda that the city council can vote on and send this to the planning commission for review and action. The three amendments that have been initiated for 2019 are the uh, update of the six year transportation improvement program. That's an annual amendment that we do. Uh, it is to adopt the Bethel Corridor Plan as uh, an uh, appendix uh, item, a, a document adopted by reference in Appendix B of the Comprehensive Plan. And finally, uh, we are looking at updating the city's local center's policies to be consistent with recently adopted criteria and terminology from PSRC. And that's something that we will work through with the Planning Commission and refine uh, the form that it's in tonight as a draft form, and I expect that to, to, to change slightly as, as it moves through the process. The staff recommendation is that the City Council vote to approve the 2019 Comprehensive Plan Amendment Agenda pursuant to 20.04060 as presented. Okay. Councilor Chang. I move to approve the 2019 Comprehensive Plan Amendment Agenda pursuant to Port Orchard Municipal Code 20.04060 as presented. Second. Council Member Diener seconded that motion. To further discussion of the docket. I, well, I have a question. Um, the first item, the um, six-year trans, the six-year six tip. Do we see that? I mean, we haven't created that yet, have we? Correct. the The public works department will draft, uh, or has drafted that. It will get reviewed by the planning commission. But really, it's it's shifting all the projects over one year and and renaming the columns at the top of the page. I don't think we're adding anything. We, we, yeah, we may have added something, but uh, you'll see it when it comes back from the Planning Commission. Okay. That was that was my question. Thank I, you. Yeah, I apologize. It's not in the packet. I. Um. It was an earlier work study draft. Okay. Right. Yeah, we've, we've updated, well, I think three or four years ago, PSRC had that statewide mm -hmm. or MPO-wide kind of a recalibration of what right. tips look like. And we, I think we had a pretty robust uh, public process to show what we have on our tip. Um, we've just continued to refine that over each annually. And I think this last one, we finally added Sydney from Tremont to Highway 16 as a complete street, but it's in the tier two because our tier one is only reasonably constrained projects. Other questions? All right, with that, we'd be voting on the approval of the 2019 Comprehensive Plan Amendment uh, Agenda Docket. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. The docket is approved. Okay, I brought uh, one discussion item. I'm gonna throw them our agenda was lighter. I thought it was a little lighter, but our, a couple of presentations tonight, but uh, um, we had, I want to discuss City Hall, use of City Hall after hours, and Council Member Chang uh, had, did a very uh, commendable thing from a humanitarian aspect uh, during the cold weather when we had just before the snowstorm, and he opened up City Hall for um, a warming shelter on, over the weekend. And um, what, after the fact, I, Brandy and I looked at our policies and I talked a little bit with our insurance company about it, and they had um, uh, grave concerns about it from, our, from a liability standpoint with our insurance company. In particular, the comments they, they shared with me was, one, our building really isn't designed um, to be used in that manner. Um, they, they pointed to a city Olympia that they insure that has uh, a portion of their building that's secure and was created for that purpose. Um, and uh, if we were to use City Hall in that manner, they would uh, recommend that we uh, develop a policy and procedures, and we have uh, a, a section on our code 2.74 that we would need to amend. Um, 
they highly recommended that we would have um, staff and the train and staff training and paid staff doing that function and not and not a, one of our council members um, uh, so th th that was the long and the short of it and then in our packets I put um, you know the current policy or the facilities use um, ordinance it's a resolution isn't it, Brandy I think this is a resolution it's a resolution or an ordinance 2.74 uh, it's both our uh, quarter two municipal code chapter 2.74 outlines um, who has uh, the ability to use the facilities and then resolution 1880 adopts the uh, charges to use those facilities that's another piece to this too is this made us aware too that we're probably and there's there are provisions in this for council members and and myself to use the facilities after hours if, if they're bit for business purposes um, and that's called out in number four um, and the uh, if they're not for bus you know business purposes related to, to, to council members or myself that there are there are fees and charges and we it's $35 is that correct Brandy um, currently an hourly rate for after hour staffing correct yeah and much like the police overtime that was brought to us a few months back we evaluated and it should be closer to a hundred um, mm -hmm. uh, Brandy's recommendation would probably be if uh, we should bring this back at a future date and, and amend that to probably $75 an hour to closer capture our costs but I just wanted to have some discussion with you guys um, you know do we want to amend these policies do we want to amend um, the cost to be used the building so with that I'll open it to you Mr. Chang I just want to explain that this happened on Sunday the 10th of February when we had the snowstorm and what happened that morning was that none, none of the nearby churches were open the severe weather shelter had let out to all the people who'd stay the night before at 7 a.m. Uh, the warming shelter on DeKalb was not open on that Sunday. The library, which is usually open at 1 a.m., canceled. The, as you may remember, both the library and City Hall did not open for much of that week. And knowing that everything was locked at City Hall and none of the rooms actually, which are mentioned in this resolution, would be available or open, I thought, well, does anybody want to come in and just sit in the hallway and use the bathrooms? Um, it turned out that about six to eight people did come by. Uh, some of them had stayed at the shelter the night before. Uh, I did work one of the um, shifts the night before, so I was aware that there were people that were in need of places that weren't freezing. And I think probably what tipped the, the, uh, the, 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 the balance for me was that one of the guests at the shelter was a young woman who was pregnant. Uh, so it seemed to me that just opening City Hall and everything was locked. I stayed here with them to make sure that they weren't, you know, misusing the hallways. And I came up, I actually sat downstairs to watch in case anyone came in. And I'd come up just once an hour to check on them. And what happened is that they, when the uh, severe weather shelter reopened at five that night, they then went over the severe weather shelter. Um, I would actually urge that we consider, since the resolution doesn't talk about um, the hallways, and we're not renting out the hallways, that this may be something that uh, might ease the, the insurance company's concerns. Councilmember Ashby? Well, what, <clears throat> what I would say, or one of my thoughts is, I know that here, and I don't know, it was two or three years ago, Mayor, you had a special committee mm -hmm. that worked with the faith-based community and other people, and um, a, a result of that was the um, severe weather shelter at, at the United Methodist. And I'm wondering, would it be possible to reconvene that and perhaps get the faith-based community to do a warming shelter so that, um, so that the people who... Um, would be there would be trained and and they would have more um, amenities than we do here at City Hall well I know that typically those shelter there is one on DeKalb 
that's open, the, the church there typically opens. Yeah. Um, we had a fairly unique storm event. Um, some say it was a 100-year storm of event uh, with the snow. <coughs> um, people couldn't get. Right. Uh, you know, the, the, all the, obviously the volunteers at the church couldn't get there because um, that, that is normally open in cold weather. And it's, so we've got the um, Methodist Church here on Kitsap Street that is doing the, the severe overnight. well, the overnight, overnight shelter. Yeah. Um, you know, and maybe it's a conversation with them, you know, and, and them. I mean, there's only two churches here downtown that, right. that are basically, you know, we've got the, the Lutheran Church out on Mitchell that's doing the meals. Uh, we've got the severe weather shelter. Um, so I don't, I don't, it's not that, that those things aren't normally in place because um, they are. Um, and uh, I don't know that convening that group is going to would, would would have solve any sol solve it at. You it know? was kind of where my mind went. And when, when the, there was a lot of notice about this event, and it started snowing Friday, and this happened on Sunday. Um, I'm surprised that there weren't people that stayed at the church to keep it open the next day. And I, my, my concerns were just more from a liability. Oh, if something agreed. would have happened, <clears throat> right. um, we're putting ourselves at risk. Right. Because that's because that's a the, completely different issue than trying to provide shelter for the people. Yes. Council Member Diener? I, I would be willing to talk more about putting the committee back together, perhaps because um, we could be faced with more and more such events given the trend on global climate. So I don't know that we should think that this may not happen again or happen again anytime soon. It could, and we just don't want to be caught unprepared. So maybe it's not a committee. Maybe it's a lessons learned and a, it's a conversation. Others just have okay. I do have a question, and... I just am wondering, um, Fred, why you didn't call the mayor or one of us or get some feedback. Did, did you do that? Did you try doing that at all? No, actually, I didn't see the mayor until the next day when, we were, when he was sledding on Sydney. And I was walking up the hill and I said, by the way, this is what happened yesterday. Um, it did not seem to me that, it, it, to me, it did not seem, I obviously didn't think about liability. These were people I'd seen at the shelter the night before. I knew they needed a warm place, and I figured City Hall is relatively warm compared to outside. Uh, so I didn't think it was that big a deal. Well, I just, I'm just i just thinking, too, if, if there had been an emergency, I mean, how would you have been able to solve it? And um, I had concerns when I heard this, and I often think, you know, we're just one of a whole council, and I would have really wanted input, and I, well, I think that that's a wonderful thing to want to help. Um, I'm concerned about acting just as an individual, and um, not having had policy, I think it would have been appropriate for you to actually invite them to your home. That's something that we can do because we have the authority of our own homes, um, but to actually um, open up City Hall causes me a fair amount of concern, so considering that no one in authority was consulted. That's, that's my big thing. Um, I think the mayor lives so close by, and you know he responds so quickly, and then we have Mayor Pro Tem. Just having feedback from somebody else other than ourselves, because we don't always look at the whole picture. And I think many of us want to help, especially, as you said, you had, there was a woman who was pregnant, but um, you know, it concerned me when I heard that, for that reason. Mr. Torsi, you have something? Yeah, Jerry? I guess just clarification of the conversation. So if, if staff was directed to move forward with something, I want to make sure that we're all clear that, so the current code and resolution speaks to use by an entity like a business or when, you know. We'd have to create something. Yeah, this is, the shelter's a completely different thing. And I guess my concern is, one is if it's weekends, it's warmer than outside, I guarantee it. It's still, the, 
the heating system doesn't work on the weekend. I agree with uh, Council Member Ashby where, you know, we really don't have amenities, don't have cots or anything, no place to really sit. Um, and the facility isn't really as secure. Take off. <laughs> no, I've never had that happen before. Anyway, everybody uh, knew it was you, but you. <laughs> it, it's never happened before. Um, you know, because if you're on the first floor, if nobody's watching, you can still get up to the third or the first floor. And there's even though the doors are locked, I know like the the glass in front of the clerk's office is that's not in the broadcast is not very secure. <laughs> so, and then you got the big boat. You know, it's on a wobbly leg, and so. You know, unless you got somebody that's there, like really keeping an eye on adults or kids or whatever, it's sitting in the hallway. I mean, we had the after event emergency you're, you're, management day, and we were yeah. talking about shelters and what we learned from things. So it seems like if we were to do this, we would have to designate a specific area and have the ability to close off whether there's some sort of gate that they're all on the first floor or where it's warmer because we do heat up the first floor seven days a week. So I just want to you know point those things out yeah that, and what was one of the recommendations if we develop a policy that we have paid staff on site so that's a budget item too so we need to consider that too council member president uh, i'd com commend fred for taking action um but I, I would again echo what everybody else has said that this isn't the proper place for it to occur uh, both from security and from uh, liability uh, so, and I personally don't have any interest in trying to make this a secure shelter. Uh, all bets are off in a tornado or something like that. That's not the occasion here. Council Member Shire. And I would just kind of echo, you know, liability, and I'll maybe add just a little more color to it. I mean, as a, as a council, we're here to protect the interest of our entire city, all of the assets, and so that's why we are a policy board, is to make sure that we're protecting all of those interests. And um, while I'm not an attorney, I think when, if we act, you know, as individuals outside of the scope of, of our elected official duties, I think there could be personal liability if there was an event that to go down and so i just would just encourage all of us you know when we have these great ideas with with valor I mean, and merit that we just be careful and, and and go through the systems because there could be unintended consequences that could be that could have some dire re repercussions so i'm not hearing so what is what am i well i guess i heard jay say he's not interested in changing this policy i know at least staff for we're interested in bringing back an updated fee ordinance uh, that made us look when we looked at all of this uh, other thoughts on updating council member Dino? I, I agree I don't think this is the best facility but I, I want to go back to not foreclosing on the idea that we could see more of these in the future and so we should engage in a mm -hmm. broader community conversation about that mm -hmm. I like your idea to reconvene that committee and talk about these events and what happened right with the breakdown yeah. and to see if we can D create and well, and a safety net and it, it, Jay mentioned it, it's not, it didn't have to be just a snow event. We also had the tornado. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you never know when something like right. that is going to happen. And how can we act to provide some secure place for the citizens? Well, and that, that when those events of that nature happen, that's what the Department of Emergency Management is for. That's they, correct. They activate. And right. They, we, we, they contact me. They, we. I make a, a declaration of an emergency, and then we have access to county resources. They activate uh, shelters, and, you know, they reach out to transit to transport people. There's there's mechanisms for that. This was, you know, a bit of an outlier. Fred, do you have the contact for the folks at the? Uh, I'm not, the weather shelter the, or the DM? The, the, no, no, no. The, um, the I'm not sure of the denomination of the church there on DeKalb and and Capital Christian. Yeah, yeah. That, that's they're the ones that are typically doing in this local area, and, and there there might have been a warming shelter out on you know at the Lutheran Church or somewhere else out. Of, but that that's a, that's a, you know, heck, it you couldn't drive anywhere, let alone walk far. You know, in, in this storm. I event. called Sarah at the Capitol Christian on that Sunday because that was my first choice. 
Um, actually, yesterday here in City Hall, we had a meeting of the site uh, managers for the severe weather shelters. So this might be something that they could take on, maybe expanding what their volunteers do. Um, as you know, every night their six volunteers are working to, to, to open each night from 6 p.m. till 7 a.m. And, and they're open this, during this cold They've actually snap, opened right? 23 of the last 24 days, almost nonstop, since February 3rd. And it's anticipated they'll be open in another week. Mm -hmm. um, so I've actually put in parts of uh, some of the uh, shifts there. So I've seen some of the, the people that come in. And um, I think the volunteers are tapped out, but I think you know, if we identify a need, they may be willing to man this. I don't know that this is something that staff would have to do if we chose to go that way. Uh, we may be able to get it manned by volunteers. Yep. Um, and there may be a better location. Yeah. Um, it was a recommendation of our insurance company. We might need a group of volunteers because they're staffing requirements, but they, their, their statement was to have a trained, a trained staff member and to have a paid staff. You know, in the city facility, if it was going to be in a city facility, um, that was the recommendation of our insurance. I mean, our insurance company is adverse to risk and wants, uh, you know, just because they want something doesn't mean it has to happen. But that was their recommendation. So that I think that's the best venue. I think is to, is outreach to that to the couple of churches that are that are in this within walking distance of City Hall because we've got the warming shelter just up the street and I don't think during the day those folks are going to travel very far so there's only a really a, a couple of locations that are that are possible so and then with that Brandy and I will work on bringing back you know in the next month or so uh, do you want it to come to a work study the fee resolution for City Hall first or a discussion added it as a brief discussion item here. That's probably an easy one. We'll make it a discussion item and then bring it back for action maybe a week later. Councilman Rosapetti. Just real quickly, when you talk about fees, um, I guess I'd be looking at Noah, you know, to say really, to make sure they're realistic, um, I find out, I find in our, my other work life, that sometimes our fees are way under what they should be to cover cost. And that's what we've discovered. Yeah. It, they're thirty-five dollars, and we need to make it. We think about seventy-five. Okay, I just but you know make sure on an hourly rate. Yeah. Why seventy-five? That seems like that's because seventy-five percent or less of the cost that we. It's would about seventy-five percent of the, the average cost. So it's yeah. So Randy. what I took is um, typically it's the clerk's office staff that would be staffing the after-hour meetings, and so I took the average hourly hourly rate with benefits for regular time and time and a half. Okay. And with so. Benefits. Okay. Yeah. So that's where the rate came from. All right. So if we wanted to cover 100 percent, it'd be about 100 dollars. Well, that's what I was thinking. That's, yeah. I, I, yeah, I th why wouldn't we why do wouldn't that? We, yeah. Why wouldn't we? Yeah. Okay. Because I, oh. I usually find out that almost. Sounds every like time. we've had the discussion item. We'll bring the action item. <laughs> <back>. <laughs> Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> right. That's really the only one on that chart was just how much we were charging. The cleaning fee seemed appropriate. The other things seemed appropriate. It was just what we were charging because we're paying our staff overtime mm -hmm. to be here because they have to be here when, when someone's renting the building. And it's the public's building, but we need to cover the cost. Mm -hmm. all right. So, all right. So with that, we'll bring, bring that one back. <clears throat> All right, we are to the council committee reports. I know finance hasn't met, and their next meeting is March 26th. They gave a report uh, last week. Economic and tourism is March 11th. It's March 11th, correct. Okay. Utilities is tomorrow, tomorrow morning. morning. Okay. I don't have that one on my calendar. I need to make that happen. 930. Mm -hmm. Okay. I can I'll be there as soon as I can. I've got a 9 o'clock. Uh, sewer advisor, advisory committee? That's not until April 17th. Okay. And land use has met. It was earlier this week. Council yep. Dean? We just met. Uh, we had a letter from the health district advising that uh, through their um, point in time homeless count that there was observations of abandoned homelessness camps. Uh, that were in violation of solid waste ordinances. We had some pictures um, that showed this quite clearly. 
but there was some confusion about where we were talking about and what properties were involved. So we're going to be looking into that a little bit more. Um, there will be a cost associated with this. It, there are some obviously hazardous materials that are often present at these sites. Uh, and so uh, Mr. Dorsey is looking into this a little bit more. And he actually sent a very well-worded email today to the health district um, asking for clarification and making sure that the other property owners were being are also getting uh, the same notification that we got because we only own a couple of those parcels in that area that are the concern. Yeah. And, yeah. and this Yeah, and this is along the Blackjack Creek corridor. Um, it's unfortunate that, you know, it might take some fencing to, to keep the problem at bay, um, but that might be the direction we're headed, as well as talking to some conservancy groups about taking over some of the properties. The next discussion item was uh, on public art and some of the control boxes that, that we had a discussion about last week. Um, we, I think, uh, Mark did a little, or maybe, I'm sorry, Nick did a little more research on this and found that DOT was likely to find that that proposal that, that we had looked at last week was inadequate, mm -hmm. that it was a vinyl uh, banner that essentially would have been adhered with some epoxy to the control boxes, and that probably was something that we felt strongly that public, uh, or DOT was not going to be supportive of. Um, and so we talked about... Uh, establishing a fund for that, perhaps $10,000 to be brought forward at the mid-biennium uh, introduction of additional funding, um, and also needing to better understand what materials would be used, how that would be funded, the long-term durability of those materials, and having a review or a scoring process for proposed art projects. So um, I think staff is working on uh, policies and procedures for that, and then, but then ultimately it will come down to whether or not those wraps cost about $1,500 right. a piece, the ones that are done properly and I think everybody agreed that the, the the pictures that were brought forward last week were pretty neat well as long as it was centered on Fort Orchard's history not yes. to interrupt your report but if someone is looking at um, a policy for that I would like it to be a little more overarching um, for any public art we have um, We have a, a public, what is it called, public art program, and it, it defined where perhaps sculptures could be, that sort of thing. But this is something other than that. And a few years ago, we had a group that wanted to change um, all of the art in City Hall and bring in different art than what we have up now. So I think an overall policy on public art would be a good idea so that we don't have to start each time and um, anyway that's that's just my thought. I'm okay. also just double check that we're not in, or in conflict with the sign ordinances and the district court ruling with freedom of expression you know depending on if we're saying certain things can be on and certain things can't that we get in trouble with with that ruling that came out last year do and so you're just talking about in terms of, of public art Correct. being considered signage right and yeah I'm, I'm not sure that it would be considered signage in the same way as as so we as just other. want to check that box yeah mm -hmm. sure i think we've got some really good examples mm -hmm. in, in neighboring mm -hmm. communities are do, that are doing yeah. this yeah, and I that's i think that's where nick's staff is is mm -hmm. looking to and uh, then ultimately it'll come down to money and whether it's a priority or not because we're going to have a bunch of things to about figure out mm -hmm. so count sorry to keep interrupting your report oh well, that's all right good stuff so then the last two items were the uh disc were discussion about development regulations and the comprehensive plan amendment docket and we just had some casual discussion about some of the items that had been presented we talked about for example the storage changes to the storage units and how those are required to go up to a second story at least and require an analysis to warrant their um, development um, we talked about some c coming changes that, that uh, next group will be looking at in, in terms of future code changes, um, including plat thresholds, um, on-site recreational facilities for uh, larger developments, and a tree replacement uh, ordinance to come at some point. Um, and then we talked about a potential zoning amendment to uh, a piece of property just north of China Sun where 
the landowner, uh, landowner's representative may want to come in at the, at the potentially last moment to look at a zone change Is from commercial to mixed use. Actually, commercial. a map, a map change, not a zoning comprehensive plan change. It'd be a change to the map, correct? Change to the zoning map. Yeah. Yeah. Is are we talking the what's known as the um, target property or the? No, no, no. Okay. It's, a, it's just the adjacent uh, to just the adjacent, just to the north. north of the China Sun, there's there's a piece that's been listed for quite a while. It's got significant wetlands on the back side okay. of it. Okay. Yeah, about yeah, about forty percent development. Okay. And that was it. Okay. Uh, oh, go ahead. next meeting is March twenty five, nine thirty at DCD's offices. Okay. Is that right? Uh, I think so. For Tuesday, yeah. Lodging tennis. Nothing to report? No, actually, we have a meeting scheduled, so don't. Okay. Sorry to surprise everybody. Wow. Uh, so it's. Uh, give that to Brandy. Next Wednesday at uh, 5 30. And uh, so I'll need to talk with Noah before then. Get some okay. figures. All right. And then uh, chimes and lights? That's tomorrow at 3 30 here at City Hall. Wonderful. And outside agencies. Beck, do you have anything for KRCC? I do not. Yes, um, I've seen. Or <laughs> any other acronyms? <laughs> yeah, I, I really do not. We have um, uh, KRCC meets next Tuesday. We did have a plan, Paul, meeting that you attended mm -hmm. that Nick will bring it. We were discussing the centers and populations, and, and that will come forward um, more than likely when we're doing our comprehensive plan. But other than that, um, I, I really don't have anything to report. Okay. All right, and I, I don't either. Next Tuesday is Super Tuesday. Yeah. I'll have all kinds of things. It's just whether I can remember them all. So on to the mayor's report. Uh, this is a regional maritime magazine that uh, gets sent to City Hall. And on the cover of it, and there's an article inside, is the MB Waterman. And, uh, I knew from my transit meeting last week that uh, it went in the water and it floated. So that's a good thing. It's a boat. So if you'd like to see the magazine or the article, you're, you're welcome to it. And uh, the uh, RP class boats aren't far behind. This boat should be in Kitsap Transit's possession in the next 30 days. And probably in a month after that, it'll be in operation. It's a 150 passenger vessel. And it's the boat that will travel between Port Orchard and Bremerton. Carlisle will become the uh, backup vessel. Um, so it's an expensive boat to operate and maintain. And we still want to keep that beautiful piece of our history, but just not operate it every day. Or Kitsap Transit doesn't anyway. The city doesn't operate it. Uh, we got our uh, Well City Award. So we got a two, uh, we just notified that from our uh, AWC. Here's our healthcare provider. And uh, I, Continue to plug the Community Service Day on April 27th, and I made a couple of map corrections. I'll bring start circulating those uh, maps here soon. Um, I do have, so next year is the 2020 fund, uh, application process for funding at KRCC. And with Tremont, all the projects that we have on our plate, I'm not convinced that we're going to get very far. We, we, what we, you know, what we know we learned at Tremont is we're not going to ask for any type of a design or right away money mm -hmm. in, a, in a funding request. So I'm trying to find things that we could maybe design in house because I always want us in these cycles to have a project at least. Otherwise, we're missing um, those. Those dollars are going to be awarded to somebody, and we should always try to get a piece of them. So Mark and and uh, and I've been brainstorming a little bit. And, and I'll just toss this out. Uh, what about, you know, in front of Cedar Heights is four lanes and the road's in really pretty bad shape there because we've made a number of sewer cuts in it. I don't, I don't believe that road needs to be four lanes. And so from Lippert to Berry Lake, if, if we design, I think Ian could draw this up in house uh, once we have, a, have it surveyed and we could do a multimodal project and put that road on a diet and put bike paths in. We have all the right of way, we would just narrow the roadway to, to two lanes, a, rain, a lane each direction is 
How, how far would that extend again? From Lippert to Berry Lake. Okay. And uh, widened sidewalks, put in bike paths, got a school zone. Um, what, I, what I observe there is <clears throat> people race each other, race, a, you got a school zone there and they pass on the right hand side. And uh, we just don't really have a traffic need for four lanes in that little short area. So How about just, from Tremont? We, we just can't afford it. <laughs> Two for between what we're doing on the intersection, mm -hmm. then we're doing s from sunset to May. From May, we've got a sidewalk project there, but to to add the bike path, we'd have to rip out a bunch more sidewalk and acquire right of way, which is going to be beyond the scope of what I'm looking for. Some a small victory <clears throat> that we can get something in a in a. Grant but proposal. it's pretty built out, and then from from South Kitsap Boulevard all the way to Lippert, all those frontages were done by developments adjacent to. So you've got a three lane road with bike lanes and sidewalks. So if we put a road diet from Lippert to Berry Lake, um, then you have basically new infrastructure almost, you know, ninety percent of the way from Tremont to Berry Lake, and then from Berry Lake south we're looking at projects in there where the developers are going to be doing the fringe improvements through there. The beauty of it is we get new blacktop in that section of the road that's really bad and a, and a project to do it. So is there... So go ahead. No, Councilman Rosenberg. No, I was just kind of going to do a knee-jerk. Okay. Um, having observed it from a school perspective and with the amount of, of apartments and traffic there, mm -hmm. so would we be looking at the possibility of putting in a, a turn lane in the middle, which would take some of, uh, of the uh, meeting up. The only reason I bring that up is people wanting to go into Ridgemont, the various mm -hmm. places, mm -hmm. and traffic coming in both directions that's mm -hmm. heavy at several times a day. Mm -hmm. I'm just throwing that out there that going to single lane <coughs> might be kind of tough if there's not uh, a, a, center turn lane. a center turn lane. So we might have to evaluate whether that, that some of that I'm, landscape yeah. AON gets modified too and, and, and allowing some some left turn movements and my other uh one well i'm just making that since i we put in for a grant from the school district last year and we didn't get it and that was to have some uh crossings mm -hmm. uh, with the uh, lighting okay. uh, and i think that could very well be yeah, part so of this i'm just throwing that out in so that area in yeah. that project I, I would ask um Mark, do we have to get that in the tip? Because we're not talking regional dollars, we're talking countywide dollars. Um, and, and again, that is competitive, but does it need to be in our tip? Uh, yeah, I think so. Second tier, I believe, for all of the potteries that you pulled in. Is it? Okay, next member. I would just, I would. Yeah, it, would need, it would need to be in there, yes. Yeah. yeah. So but it sounds we like have. it is, but not on the first tier. And, and I'm open to other ideas, but right. they've got to be small and, you know, something we can do in-house and that don't involve acquiring right-of-way. So, Council Member Diener. Well, so I'm all about multimodal. I love that idea, but wouldn't it be great if we could continue that past Berry Lake to Sydney Glen Elementary? So you got a school-to-school -school connection, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Great idea, other than there's a pocket. Right-of-way. There's a, and there's a pocket of county in the midst of that. We don't know. That isn't the city. Yeah, okay. We do, I think we'd be amenable to annexing that, but there's a which pocket is, of county right there. Yeah. I which know. is one of my personal pet peeves about the UGA. Yeah. And then there'd be right of way. Well, that's the yeah. the donut hole. Yeah. But there'd be potential right of way issues. Right. Continuing that direction. So, but it, it's something we can look at. We're going to get a surveyor. We're, we're going to get a surveyor out. We're going to spend a little bit of staff time on it, and and I'm just. Didn't want to surprise you with no, it, but I like it. So, because I, I, I just what what I want to do is uh, take Sedgwick or excuse me Bethel Phase One from Salmonberry to to Blueberry and design it and and go after a grant for that. But w I know we're not going to get there uh, between when this these grant applications and and that's going to require a significant grant match and we're just not ready for that yet yeah the other thing that i'm just going to say out loud is this um the the transportation funding competition that will be next year 
those monies will not be available to us until 22 and 23 or 23 and 24. So that's why it's important to always know what projects we want in that pipeline mm -hmm. because they're out so far before you actually can obligate the monies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and that's, I think, I mean, I'm not, I think that a segment of Bethel is really where we want to be. Mm -hmm. um, we're just, we're not, we're not there right now today. And mm -hmm. we've got to finish paying for, for uh, Tremont. I don't know why I couldn't remember Tremont right now, but, and we've got, um, you know, other obligations, you know, so we, some other significant projects. So on a positive note, Beth, Beck and I went down uh, to Olympia yesterday. Uh, and we we had very good meetings. Uh, kind of spent a couple minutes with Senator Randall, met with DOT staff, and made sure that we were uh, in their good graces, and we are. Uh, there's not a problem there. And we found out yesterday, and I, we thanked her personally, uh, that Senator Randall has got our uh, six million for uh, Sedgwick in the Senate Transportation Package that was released yesterday. So. Uh, haven't seen a house package yet or we're not sure if we're going to or whether they'll just try to amend what uh, the Senate brought forward but I plan to travel to Olympia Thursday and to testify in support and uh, thank Senator Hobbs who Beck and I also met with on that snowy day and you normally get five minutes with or seven minutes with everybody we were there and weren't really rushed because the halls were empty of Olympia because the sane people were at home <laughs> during the snowmageddon but uh, anyway so that was a very successful day yesterday uh, i'm encouraged to see that in the in the package and uh, tend to go continue to support uh, that being uh, funded so that that's the end of my report and we are to report department heads mr dorsey uh, so on that same note when you go down to testify that one graphic that showed all the interchanges from the Tacoma Narrows Bridge to Loxie Egan's, and it showed this, uh, you know, uh, capacity, and then when it hit Sedgwick, it went. Do you? You've got that right. I sent that to you back. Yeah, I. I, I, ha I have one minute, and, yeah. and oh. my and our lobbyist is very provided very succinct comments for okay, me well that's that's a very it's not then they don't want details okay well that's an important detail that that was like compared to all the it's like its function was like 10 percent so that's really the key other than senator randall none of them care um <laughs> i'm sorry and Be then honest. just as a this year psrc rpac uh we're currently at what uh, Kelly McGordy thinks is a current $14 million uh, delivery hole. If uh, projects, those are like confirmed that aren't going to be able to deliver. And so that money is going to go out of state. Um, so we're trying to get some of that for the Tremont project, but they think that number is going to grow uh, as they're asking for any projects that were like we could. If we want, we could move our situational study, that 500,000 up from 2022 to 2020 or 2021. I don't really wanna do that right now because we've got enough on our plate, but that's what they're asking members of the MPO to do is to advance their projects so that they don't have a delivery hole. Um, but fingers crossed that there will be a delivery hole and RPEC will do something historic and not allow that money to go out of the state and actually f put money on an existing project. So fingers crossed that's what we're working on with them. Thank you, Mr. Dorsey. Mr. Crocker? Uh, nothing for me, thank you. Okay, Mr. Bond? Yeah, two announcements. Um, first of all, the uh, West Sound Utility District did withdraw their SEPA decision today, and so we are no longer uh, appealing that decision and are working uh, with them in the county to come up with a solution on the Phillips Road issue. Uh, second, the Vision 2040, we had a really productive meeting at the regional staff committee level at PSRC last Thursday. I think that the policies um, I've shared with the land use committee, um, we will be discussing these at the March work study. 
Um, and this is really where the rubber meets the road in terms of policy language being considered today that's going to have implications during the next comprehensive plan update. So uh, PSRC is hosting a Vision 2050 open house to present the uh, draft supplemental EIS uh, in Bremerton, and that is actually March 19th. That's right before our work study meeting. And so uh, from four to six in Bremerton, you can go learn about Vision 2050 and the alternatives that are being presented. I don't know how high level this will be or whether it will get uh, more technical. I think at least one or two of you attended one of their last open houses and found it to be um, a, a very high level overview. Um, but anyway, if you're interested, you can, you can attend uh, that open house in Bremerton. And uh, I will be sending out the draft policy language. I think it's important for you to read what's in strike through and underline and, and sort of understand the specific language changes that are being brought forward. Um, they have a lot of implications regarding our obligation to prioritize funding for certain types of development. And I think we need to, to carefully look at this and comment on it, uh, you know, looking out for the best interests of the city. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bond. Sharon, do you have anything to share? Nothing tonight. Reinerson. Yes, so I just wanted to, obviously you guys heard the sound system this evening and we're having some issues and so believe it or not, we actually uh, tested it this afternoon and everything seemed to be running just fine. So um, it appears that we may have some issues that are um, above uh, the clerk's office and the IT staff's um, um, experience. So we will uh, do some uh, research and I'm sure it's going to be a, a hefty expense and most likely bring it to finance committee to see what uh, the council would like to do. So once we know more, we will share it with you guys as well. So hopefully we can get ahead of the uh, equipment failure versus we can be proactive re rather than reactive. So okay. that's all I have. Thanks for the good news. All right. With that. Uh, we're to our second citizen comments period. Jerry or Melissa, you have anything you'd like to share with us tonight? All right. Then we're going to make this meeting adjourned.